A group has called for a change in the NIS policy asking the Immigration Service to accept consent letters from mothers when processing passports for minors. Although their policy says either mother or father can provide a consent letter, the NIS only collects from fathers, and this provides a challenge for single mothers who might not be able to access the unavailable fathers. Uh, so they're asking the Controller General to make it possible for the NIS to accept letters from mothers. And joining us to discuss this is Waimi Iribo. She is the founder of Vivo Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us, Waimi. A pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Great. This is a very, very, very important conversation for all mothers, not just <laughs> um, on national TV, but everywhere. And yeah. it's very important that you pointed out the fact that, yes, it is recent in print that the letter can come from either the mother or the father. But then there is um, some form of um, emphasis on the father. Uh, let me start by asking why you decided to take on this advocacy. Um, so, you know, the funny thing, we've actually been sitting on this campaign since last year. Um, and this is because, you know, um, we've had so many stories and so many instances of the injustice that women or mothers rather have faced in trying to access um, passports for their children. So the Weaver Foundation is a community based platform that supports single mothers across Nigeria. Um, and so within the community itself, we have so many stories of women who have come forward to say, you know what, I've suffered injustice, I've been disgraced, I've been embarrassed just trying to get passports for my children. Um, one of them, you know, child almost lost a scholarship opportunity because she couldn't get the passport for her child. And so for me, it's like, this has to stop. We can't sit down and let this continue because at the end of the day, beyond the mothers, it's the children that are involved, right? So you're you're stopping the lives of these children who possibly will get scholarships or even travel abroad and, and gain exposure that literally changes the course of their lives. Um, so I think mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just time, you know, to begin to have this conversation. Interestingly, one would ask, um, and without trying to sound like a feminist, which I'm not one, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but if the tables were turned and if the roles are reversed, when the father goes with a consent letter, why do they not insist for the mother? Because, of course, it takes two to make a child. And in, in if we're going to go by what's written in letter by the NIS, then both letters should be made available. And in the case where one parent is unavailable, then they should be able to take that of the other who's available. Um, but has this case, apart from the advocacy, has this case gone to court before? Has it ever been um, adjudicated upon? Yes, I think it has. I think it's currently in court, but there hasn't been any um, um, final, you know, word on it. But it has gone to court once, I think, but nothing has come out of it yet. And I think for me, that's where the injustice comes because, I mean, even since the advocacy started, we've not had any father come forward to say, I tried to apply for a passport for my child and I was denied, right? And I was asked to go and get a consent letter from, um, from the mother. And this is why this mm. conversation needs to be had because for me, any policy law system whatever, that pos poses extra levels of uh, hurdles for mothers. It has to be challenged. And that's why we're challenging this right now, because there hasn't been, I, I haven't heard, and I'm, I'm looking forward to actually hearing one man who comes forward to say, you know, they asked me for a consent letter from my wife. And, you know, the funny thing is, even when women provide every other thing, because it says, I mean, there are requirements, right? The requirements and there are people who say, oh, but when we started the, the advocacy, people like, oh, go to court and get an affidavit of single motherhood. That is, first of all, that's let's unpack, let's pack that, you know, separately. But even when women go to court and get this document and bring this document to the immigration office, they still are not allowed to get passports for their children. So I feel like there are too mm. many levels of, you know, the, the, the hurdles are too many, and we need to begin to unpack them, you know, so that people can move forward with their lives because it's 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 completely unfair, you know. Mm. In unpacking this, let's also try to, you know, strike a balance. We've struck, we've struck a balance in who shows up and, you know, if it's the tables were turned. But let's I have had cases where um, fathers have called on a radio show to say, well, um, a woman took my children out of the country without my consent. We did not have the conversation um, and, and I've not been able to get access to my children. Same thing for... The men, we hear people say they take their children out of the country and say, well, they're my children. I'm going to pay for this. I'm their father. I have the last say. Um, so this, for many, would seem that it is a cultural problem, which the NIS has also one way or the other uh, inculcated and brought to some level of, you know, um, bias towards the women. 
but also, I mean, mostly the women in this case. Um, so what do you say in that regard? Because I'm thinking if you're coming to me to, you know, advocate on stuff like that, and I'm a man who's been robbed of his children by a woman who was able to maybe use her father's name or her father's power, know somebody somewhere, and was able to get a passport and take my children out of the country. How are you able to um, get me involved in this advocacy? Um, and I, I, I'm sure that this is where really, this is where this rule, you know, or, or policy or law came from, right? Because we cannot deny the fact that, yes, indeed, there are um, human trafficking, you know, um, instances and, you know, uh, kidnapping or whatever it is that we want to call it. But if a woman provides everything and even shows you evidence that, look, this man is alive, I'm trying to reach him, he's refusing to accept refusing to acknowledge there's there's a way we can we can show that right because i mean the conversation even went on on twitter and you find people who are actually screen grabbing conversations between them and the and the fathers of their children who are refusing to acknowledge these conversations so if i come forward enough to show you proof to say look i have tried my best to get consent from this man and he's not accepting or he's not coming forward then i don't think it should stop anybody because at the end of the day like i said you it becomes completely biased towards the mother, right? And I, that's that's the, that's what we're, we're fighting against. We do not want a system or a policy or a structure that pulls any extra hurdles um, um, on mothers. So at the end of the day, yes, those instances happen, but we cannot use one instance to, co you know, cover every other person's um, uh, life experience and just stop everybody at, and say, because we, we've had a couple of instances where this happens, then every other person should be fo falling under that blanket and we, we, you know, mothers should not be able to accept uh, um, uh, passports for their children. Because at the end of the day, just like you said, it's both ways, right? So it happens on, on the father's side, it also happens on the mother's side. But if I prove to you and I show to you that, look, I am trying, because this is why we get instances where people actually tell you, you know what, I went ahead and I forged a death certificate or I forged a signature just be able to, to be able to pass. Yes, these things happen. And it's just because we have hurdles like this. At, you know, at the end of the day, they'll tell you it's Nigeria, anything was. But why do we have to do it in that way when we can just ensure that people do the right things in the right way and everybody moves forward? Um, let's talk about in the case of absenteeism, absent fathers or absent mothers. You know, I've heard cases where a woman just jetted Absolutely. and left the children behind. Oh, uh, same yeah. thing for the men. You know, the woman gets pregnant. He refuses to acknowledge the child. You train the child to a certain level and then you want to send the child out of the country. And then you get to a passport office and they say, well, who's the father? And you say, well, his absence. He's never been in the child's life. Um, again, that also is a spanner in the wind of things. Um, could we bring the issue of affidavits in and, and what weight does the affidavit carry in this instance? So apparently that's what the immigration office would ask you to go and do, actually go to court and swear an affidavit of single parenthood. Um, and then but the, the issue here is for some immigration offices, even when you do that, they still refuse and they humiliate you and refuse to give you a passport for your child. Because at the end of the day, while I even have to be the one to prove that I'm a single parent, the one who is showing up, the one who is there, who is taking care of a child, I still have to go to court, spend my time and my resources to go and swear an affidavit to show that I am taking mm -hmm. care of my child, you know, but I bring this to you and then you still refuse. So what are we doing? Mm -hmm. so what is the level of coming from? Yes. What is the level of dialogue between the Vivo Foundation and the NIS or at every level? Um, have you been able to pull through or are you even getting the attention in any in any way? Not yet. We're not getting the attention yet. Um, the conversation is starting. Thank you to, you know, Plus TV for, you know, having us on this. So we're hopeful that somebody hears it and gets it to them. But we're looking forward to actually, you know, uh, hearing from them and getting into dialogue and ensuring that for both parts, for both parties, both the fathers and the mothers at the end of the day, you know, because we're hopeful that if we move this forward for, for mothers, then at the end of the day, the fathers who are also in this situation will also bear um, the benefits of this as well. So we're hopeful that the NIS will reach out to us or we'll get into some dialogue with them somehow. Mm. Uh, because again, when you are pushing advocacies like this, it's always best to start with dialoguing um, with the people who are at the core of this matter, which is the NIS, um, whether it be at state levels, at local government levels, or at the federal level. But let's talk about the Vivo Foundation. Um, how wide is your spread? Are you at the national level? Are you at, are you in states? Um, because again, this again would um, 
one way or the other determine the attention that would be given to this advocacy. And I'm not in any way saying that this is not good, even if it starts in Lagos, but then um, what is the spread of the People Foundation? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually based in Abuja, but the People Foundation is spread across Nigeria. Um, and, you know, we're even now going into Ghana. So we have community members spread across almost all the states in Nigeria. So this is not just a local thing, which is why this is a national campaign. It's not a campaign that is targeted at any NIS for a particular state. It's targeted at the entire, you know. So we're hoping that by the time we're getting to dialogue with them and get into conversations, we're able to get to the point where whatever solutions we come up with are going to be able to spread throughout, you know, all the NIS offices across the states in Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I'm most interested, and I want to ask a very sexist question. Um, how do you, as a foundation, not make this advocacy look like a feminist advocacy? Because there's always that, um, you know, issue of, oh, this is another feminist movement. And like I said, again, there's nothing wrong with feminism or the feminist movement. But then there is also that, you know, stigma attached to anything that has, feminism written all over it oh they've come for the men um is this advocacy also involving men because men are also victims of these cases of their children being taken from them um with the guy in the guise of absenteeism or you know yeah. forging papers yeah it's a very very interesting question funny enough we've had um a lot of men also sign the petitions we've had um men who were raised by mothers and had to go through this experience as well um, I think for me, the reason I would say it's not a feminist um, campaign is because we're not we're not focusing directly on the mothers. We're focusing on the children because the mothers can get their passports. So this is not about the mothers in that sense. It's about the children. And if you stop a child from getting a scholarship that can change a child's life, from getting access to health care, I'll share a story with you. There's a member of our community who um, had a child who was ill when she was when he was born. Um, and had someone who was willing to sponsor a health, full health check and, uh, you know, health for the child in India. And the father of the child refused to give a consent letter until today the child hasn't been able to access that health care because they cannot get a passport. So this is beyond women. This is beyond mothers. This is about the children. And that's why the focus is getting passports for the children. And of course, children are male and female, right? So this is absolutely not a feminist. It's not a feminist conversation in that sense. The only reason it will seem that way is because, of course, the mothers are the ones who are advancing, who are in front to say, look, I want to get a passport for my child. That's the only reason why this the, the name is the mother is even coming up in the conversation. Right. But at the end of the day, it is about the children. It's not about man or women or anything. It's the children we're focusing on. Mm. Well, I mean, let's talk about get, I'm sure that this foundation also has lawyers, whether they be male or female. Um, has there been anyone maybe going to the floor of the National Assembly to push for this also? Because, again, if if that particular phrase or that line, um, you know, in the NIS Act it needs to be contested, then you need to, we need to go back to the lawmakers. Um, what are the efforts that you're doing to push for this on the floor of the National Assembly? So we, ha we haven't pushed because we literally just started this campaign about three days ago, Friday, um, because we're... Yes, we are trying to, you know, we want to gather. It's, it's, it's not coming from the place of one or two people. So by the time you see the number of people who have signed this petition, who are also open and willing to share their experiences on the pet petition, if you have some time, please go back and try and read some of the comments on the petition. You'll find women who are sharing life experiences of how, of, of you know, some of the situations they've been through. Um, so we're in this place where, you know, we're trying to put the word out. We're trying to create awareness for this issue that is in existence that maybe not a lot of people know. But because, um, I mean, I'll give an example. Also, because the story that we use for the campaign is a story of a woman in our community, but has refused to share her identity because of the stereotype and the stigma that comes around all of this and all of the single motherhood, you know, and all of that. So for us, it's we're trying to push this out as much as we can so that there are more people who are aware of this conversation and then we'll take it forward from this. So by the time we get to the floor of the assembly, they already know that, look, this is something that they need to focus on, you know. Yeah. Uh, finally, again, um, what are the things that, because again, it's one thing to start an advocacy, it's another to educate the people that you are targeting this yeah. advocacy or rather advocating for or on their behalf. Um, how much information do you have out there for women or men who are faced with this, you know, um, hurdle of trying to get, you know, um, a passport for their infant or their minors? 
So this is where the conversation started. Um, it, it started last year from someone actually asking this question on the group to say, look, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm facing. Um, and other people are sharing their experiences of, oh, go to court and get this, go to court and do this, um, you know, get this document. You can speak to this person and see if you can jump that hurdle. So what we're trying to do is within our community, there's a lot of conversation that is already ongoing. Um, and, you know, more people who are, of course, coming out to share their experiences and people also sharing their experiences to say, look, this is how you can avoid it or this is what you can try to do. But I think it's just been a lot of conversation around this. Like I said at the beginning, we've been sitting on this for about a year. Um, but I feel it's, we just felt like, you know what, it's time. We begin to, let's push this out. And the foundation in which we're partnering with was partnered with the Vivo Foundation to actually launch this petition um, is, is a, a foundation that is also started by a former minister. So we're all in this together because at the end of the day, regardless, like I said, the children, we're focusing on the children and we really do need to move this forward. Well, Waymi um, Eribo is the founder of Vivo Foundation and the advocating uh, for um, the change in the NIS passport policy for, uh, you know, issuance of passport to minors. I want to say thank you, Waymi. This is a very, very great uh, thing that you're doing uh, for both men and women. And I hope it doesn't stop here and you continue to um, push for this to be changed. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, that's the show tonight. We want to thank you all for participating and enjoying the conversation. But if you want to uh, pick up uh, on all of our previous episodes, just go to Cross TV Africa on YouTube, like, subscribe, and you will never miss any of our shows. I'm Mary Anna Connell. See you tomorrow as we continue to talk for development. Have a good evening.